Hello everyone. You are watching scardi.com and I am Dr. Hamad Adar. Today our topic is cervical myelopathy. Cervical myelopathy as you know it's one of the very common causes of uh, associated neck pains and problems which are associated with the patient's fumbling objects and as well as having an awkward gait. By definition called as the uh, degenerative spinal spondylosis associated with the uh, fumbling of the objects from the hand as well as the awkward gait. We'll be discussing causes of the uh, cervical myelopathy. We'll be briefly going through the anatomy of the cervical spine and from anterior, middle and posterior column what are the certain factors which can actually compress the spinal cord, reduce the volume for a space available for the cord and lead to signs and symptoms of cervical myelopathy. Then we will be discussing the etiology or causes which most common is actually the degenerative cervical spondylosis but we will be discussing others as well. From then, we are moving on to the clinical features of the cervical myelopathy, the signs and symptoms, the symptoms which may a patient present with and then what are the signs which may be elicited. For example, all those upper motor neuron signs which may have to elicit on examination will be discussed in details. Then we will be discussing the imagery. As you know, with any orthopedic problem, first you have to get an x-rays, what are the different views, the AP, the lateral, the oblique and the uh, flexion extension views. Then we'll be discussing in detail that why we need flexion extension views on x-rays as well in case of cervical myelopathy and what is the gold standard which is the MRI and why we need that and what are the calculations we need to make on the MRI so that to assess the severity of the cervical myelopathy. Then on we will be discussing the classification systems. As you know there are multiple classification systems but we will be discussing mainly the Japanese Orthopedic Association Evaluation System because it is more uh, collaborative and it actually incorporates a lot of sensory as well as the upper and lower motor uh, muscular aspect as well as the urinary and bowel bladder control as well. Therefore that has to is, will be discussed in details that how to assess the upper extremity function, and the lower extremity motor function, the sensory function of the upper and motor, lower motor neurons and as well as the bladder function. We will briefly discussing the differentials and why we include these diseases such as multiple sclerosis, ALS, syringomelia, cord tumors into this cervical myelopathic differentials and what are the different signs which actually point out to cervical myelopathy are towards the, uh, these diagnoses. And then we will be coming on to the treatment. We will be briefly discussing the operative as well as the non-operative treatment. We will be dis uh, discussing in details that what are the surgical methods by which we can stabilize the spine and why we need to do the surgical decompression and the restoration of lordosis stabilization is important when we are op going for an operative treatment of cervical myelopathy. From then onwards, we are moving on to one of the common causes of the cervical myelopathy that is OPLL or ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament. We were discussing what are the signs symptoms, what are the different uh, signs which are elicited on examination and from then on we will move on to the uh, treatment of the OPLL which may include uh, radiological or a clinical uh, treatment and then we will be discussing the diagnostic criteria as well. Now the radiological and after discussing the radiological and clinical criteria we will be moving on towards the treatment which may include conservative as well as the uh, uh, operative treatment. Now when we will be doing the imagery of the, uh, we will be discussing the imagery related to OPRL, we will be briefly discussing over the lateral aspect of the cervical spine x-ray and what to look for for the uh, to diagnose the patient with ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament. From then we will be discussing the medical treatment as well as the surgical treatment of the OPRL and when the medical treatment is required and when it's we have to proceed for the surgical treatment of the PLL. So if you want to watch more videos related to orthopedics or even to the other subjects as well, go to www.scadi.com and watch all the videos over there. Thank you very much. Keep watching scadi.com.